Okay, ladies and gentlemen, for um, our, our final speaker, um, sticking with what I've done so far, um, the inspiration for inviting Kim Wilkie here was, was very easy. Um, Kim has been involved with the restoration of Villa La Pieta right since the start, and it's thanks to him that, that, that I'm here. Um, why, though, were we particularly keen? Well, one of the things, um, as a response maybe to Sir Roy's um, comment, which I wholeheartedly agree, that gardens shouldn't be preserved in aspect. They are a, a thing that develops. Gardening is a process rather than a product. But, you know, we have to preserve these gardens. There are lots of gardens that are, uh, are preserved. And one of the biggest justifications for um, doing that is that they become remarkable resources for learning. So I've learned lots of things. The major thing is I just am so embarrassed that I thought gardening would be easy in Florence. And I realise that the climate in Tuscany is just not that of most parts of England. And it makes uh, achieving anything at least 10 times more difficult. So that's my little bit of learning um, and maybe the positive things are, are coping with that. With Kim Wilkie we've asked him to talk about what he has learned from his involvement in the restoration of the garden here at Villa La Pietra and how he's put that into practice. So if I could invite Kim to take the floor. Thank you, Nick. And thank you to you brave people who've carried on to the end of the, the, the whole conference here. Um, why am I here? Um, it's to fill the graveyard slot um, <laughs> and, and also to try to pull together um, everything that's happened during the conference, which basically is an excuse for saying everyone's already said it, but I get the last word. Uh, and, and actually... Where I'd like to start is the first comment that Nancy made. She referred to Otio at, at the beginning of the, uh, of the whole morning here and talked about getting away to Otio. But actually, I think we, where I start is that our natural state is in Otio and that negotio is what happens in the city. And so this idea of Arcadia, of a harmonious relationship between man and nature and the land is where we should start. And it's a, been a recurring theme that has come through our, particularly our Western civilization, not just from the Greeks, but was revived by the Augustan poets, was revived by the Renaissance in Italy, was revived by the English Enlightenment and the landscape movement, was revived in the arts and crafts movement, and was revived in the 60s, and I think absolutely needs a voice right now. And this is a little farmhouse on the outskirts of Southampton, and there is this notion of Arcadia. It is becoming overwhelmed by the city, but with its tumble-down fruit trees, its, um, its remnant uh, of a market garden, it does sum up how we have this love of growing things and of relating to the land. And this is possibly one of the most argued about pictures um, I, I, I know, the Poussins et in Arcadio Ego. There are lots and lots of theories about it, but mine, without any kind of academic um, reason, is I think it's one of extreme optimism, which is that this isn't Olympus, this isn't Hades. Our life on Earth includes death and renewal. And actually, the essence of man in nature is that we're a part of it. We are cyclical, we come back, and that death is actually a wonderful and intrinsic part of the whole natural cycle. And one reason why I'm particularly keen to see a revival of these principles right now is that we are in a time of extreme uncertainty, financial uncertainty, political uncertainty, and certainly climate uncertainty. And returning to good instinctive principles may be a way through that. The other thing I'd like to do, 
um, I, I, two things. Um, one is, I know it is the graveyard slot, and you're tremendous for staying on for this. The moment I see a nodding head, I can finish this lecture uh, at that point. So if you start getting at all glazed over, I'm going to stop. So be reassured by that. The second is that I want to use this, and I don't know if he's left the room. He probably has. Um, I want to use this as a way also of saying thank you to Nick, because he's organized... Oh, you are still here. I saw you nip out. <laughs> um, I saw you nip out. But, but he has organized an extraordinary conference. But also, he is the one, above all, who's been responsible for, for putting this together. Mark Ebertaja, who has had to nip out, and I, originally for Bob Byrne, um, came to, to look at what should happen to this garden. And it is, it is one of those fantastically classic villas um, that, that has survived in its essence and in its principle right the way through uh, from the Sassetis and the Caponis, as uh, Avi said. And its position is absolutely no accident, as Chip will point out, that it's placed there on a ridge above um, Florence where it gets the air, it gets the good land, um, it, it, it gets the right climate and, and f has all of those common sense aspects that Nancy mentioned. But it also represents an extraordinary period in history where America, England and Florence came together. And that was a very, very powerful um, coalescence of American money, English escape from um, quite a tight and, and regulated society and adoration of the Italian life and the Florentine life. And the Actons absolutely epitomized that. And I'll go on to say how, what a force for incredible um, influence that, um, that combination of the Anglo-American um, Florentine community is epitomized in this, in this villa, I think, above many others. Ironically, they came at the point where the garden had turned into a giardino all'inglese and all of the f formal um, uh, structures had been swept away. Uh, uh, this is Arthur's plan, and it's so good to see Roy's plan where he's sketching out um, uh, what, what he was going to do, and this was Arthur doing the same thing. And Roy's absolutely right. A lot of the very great gardens have been created by amateur enthusiasts and changed and rechanged all the way through their evolution. Nick and I aren't completely in agreement about this. Um, Nick thinks that there's much more design to it. Actually, the garden isn't very well designed, but it is a wonderful garden in terms of how it is the relationship between a man's ideas and experimentation over, um, over decades, creating and refining what he wanted. Very similar to, uh, to Roy's attitude. And this, generally, I'm not going to dwell on, on this, but this is, is, this is the plan that we managed to uncover through the fantastic archives that are here, through um, reading what was written, through working with Francesca and, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and everyone else here to try and piece together how this notion of order and axes, there's the villa, um, uh, work together. And then seeing gradually how Arthur began to break free and do some things were, which were absolutely not Italian gardens and, and develop his own style. So that was the viale um, planted with Rabinias when he arrived and the, um, the cypresses that now line it. Um, the crucial view to the Duomo and how many of those villas actually visually focus on the Duomo but still can get out for their inspiration and their climate. Um, and and to, the, uh, to the surrounding villas, those visual connections all the way around. And then this extraordinary, rather haphazard collection of statuary, which actually, I think, I rather love the way that it's been jumbled around here and the garden has grown around it and actually the green architecture has made it possible for that statuary to work together. And there are, when you look at them closely, there are some 
lovely um, moments there. And as you walk around the garden at each time of day, you come across something this different. This is Eridano, um, which when you walk around most of the, t the day, you don't really notice him. But at dawn, the light just shines on him and he gleams out there. And so it is possible to go around and see a different set of statues um, every time you walk around the garden. And then most fantastically, the Pomario, um, which is the, the one bit of uh, the Caponi um, structure that still really survives. And the state that it was in by um, 1997 when, when we came. And Nick, to his credit, said, we have to start here in the Pomario. And it is, I mean, if, if, if you have been up to see it today, it is looking just so full of, of produce and horticultural expertise, and it's beautiful. But crucially, it's also a wonderful place to entertain. And that is one thing you mustn't forget about this villa. It is about entertainment as well as about produce. Um, and, uh, and the painstaking way that the pears that are there have been grafted on and replaced. And, and the limonaya, probably my favorite part of the whole um, estate. But behind that has been enormous NYU resources. These were the cracks on the Viale, and actually the whole garden had gone, it had a magic of Le Grand Meurne at, at the end of its decay. I mean, it's just a wonderful place of croaking f frogs and scents, but it was about just completely to fall to pieces. And thank goodness Harold gave it to NYU and not to Christchurch because uh, <laughs> I'm afraid it would not have been repaired in, 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 in the way that it was. Um, and uh, as you, if you've got your car parked on the Viale, um, I, I can reassure you it is now structurally sound. One of the other things that I've really learned from this is how a designer and someone who really understands um, plants and horticulture can work together to uh, get to a position where neither of you would have reached on, on your own. And Nick also said, drainage, 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 that's the first thing we've got to consider here. And because the Tempieto had been stripped of all of its vegetation and um, there had been attempts at pansies and um, magnolias and so on around about, it was absolutely on the point of collapse. And, and that was one of the first rescues that we made. And it now sits in much more stable soil and Nick's work continues to be um, as much about bringing the water in as getting it away when it rains really heavily. And again, as Roy said, the, the garden architecture, the structure of it, um, enables this huge collection of statuary to sit there. But also, Arthur very, very definitely said he didn't want flowers within the, uh, the place. It was a, a garden architecture. And in order to restore that without losing the magic of the place was the biggest challenge that we faced. The structures that were about to fall down we had to deal with, but actually the garden architecture, the, the hedges, the topiary, all of that structure, we had to cut and, and replant. And again, Nick's skill in training these to become the goblets that they're, they're returning to. And gradually going from that to that, from that to that, and then the bits that I really m most enjoy are where Arthur began to um, start flying, which is the Prato Tondo and the um, Campo Ovale, Prato Ovale. So this was the, what we were faced with at the Prato Tondo, and, and actually I climbed illegally up the scaffolding yesterday afternoon, and that was the view down from it. Um, and and I, I can't remember one, I think um, Chip was talking about the beauty of shadows being cast on the land. I mean, the way that that tree absolutely fills that space is, is exquisite. Um, and, and the Prato Ovale, just a, a very, very clever um, architectural space, which happened to host a tennis court, but, but now is full of orchids and, um, and wildflowers. And walking through there, the, the smell um, the sense of the space is, is extraordinary. And then, bit by bit, and budget by budget, we're gradually repairing the steps and the urns and the statues, um, a bit of botox going on in there. Um, and, and it is 
Uh, I mean, it's partly that you can't afford to do it all at once, but partly that you want that sense of age and connection to remain within the garden as, as you work. And Nick and his team really deserve huge, huge credit for all of this. Um, and then just a couple more just to show you that that was the, um, the, the Teatrino, um, what we were faced with, um, because the ewes really had all died. Um, what it's been returned to, but also remembering what it was used for. Um, and, and the wings, very definitely for theatrical events, but I love this Cecil Beaton photograph of, um, of Harold and Margot Fontaine coming down um, those steps there. This is my chance to have the last word on everything. I actually disagree with, with Roy about moving this garden on and sweeping it away. I think it is so drenched with history and with a very particular moment in history where in the 1930s that idea of an English-Italian garden funded by American money um, absolutely came to its, its apogee. And it, as, as a moment in history, it's worth keeping. And then for Judy Dench to come and reopen the, the theatre, it keeps it alive without, uh, within that structure. And the one thing that was wrong with yesterday evening was we should have had cocktails on that terrace. It was such a perfect evening, and this is where Hortense and her famous martinis began the evening. And within that is political history. Um, the, um, the people who came here, the guest book is absolutely phenomenal as to who came here and how they were influenced. This is um, Vita and Harold. Vita usually came on her own, but um, they, they were hugely influenced by this, and I think um, even Hidcote was influenced by this garden. This is Churchill um, here with, with Arthur. Diana and Princess Margaret were very, very keen visitors. And, and in its new incarnation, heads of state come here. And it is, it is that ability out of the city within the sanity of, of vegetation and land and, and cultural history, not cultural services, and I'm going to come on to that, that actually sane decisions can be made. And I think that, that sanity that we need to return to is an essence to what a place like this represents. I have to say, just before that conference the, of heads of state, the statue directly outside the entrance, the head fell off. So it was very quickly <laughs> hidden during, during that. But also in its new incarnation, as a place where students come and really love the place, um, I, think, I think Harold's vision of handing it on for something that was actively part of, of this whole process of understanding, understanding what um, a Renaissance villa was about, what an Arcadian vision is about, has absolutely um, worked and continues to work. So um, the, the beauty of the way it's been restored, the time it's taken, and ultimately it's a place for reflection. It is a place where you think. And so much of, of landscape is misallocated to pictures and the picturesque, but actually the essence of landscape is in poetry and the thoughts that flow from these landscapes, the ability to reflect, to imagine, to continue that cycle of being part of Arcadia, I think is at the heart of, of the real lesson for this place. Where that has led me and where I've, I've worked on other projects where this has been an influence is firstly living on the land. And I, I was lucky enough to work on the Gulag Archipelago in the White Sea. Um, up in the, just on the edge of the Arctic Circle, where there is the um, Solovetsky um, uh, archipelago of islands and this most sacred um, monastery in, in Russian history. And you approach it, it takes 24 hours on the train from St. Petersburg um, up to um, uh, Kiem, the port, which is a miserable place of rusted metal. And then you set off into the White Sea up to the Arctic Circle, not knowing what's going to happen. And then suddenly, one dome appears out of the water, and then gradually the whole monastery appears out of the water, and then, and then you're there. It is a place 
which has been so sacred for 5,000 years, way before Christianity, that it was also taken over by Lenin as the first in the Gulag archipelago, as the place to imprison the intellectuals and the, and the middle classes, and then went on through a very violent history through Stalin um, and, and so on. But here, in this vividly um, powerful place, are evidence of worship from 5,000 years ago. This, this labyrinth um, is um, several millennia old, and because it's up in the Arctic Circle, it doesn't get destroyed. But the, the monks, when they came here in the 16th century, understood what it took to live right on the edge of, of survival. And they were technologically absolutely brilliant. The first thing they did was to link up all of the waterways through these canals so that they could drain enough marshland so that they could um, have enough meadow to raise enough cattle to produce enough dung to fertilize enough vegetables to get them through. Uh -oh, maybe I'm going to have to cut, cut it short. Oh, two, two down. I'm going to have to cut it short. Um, uh, but um, they, um, they then had this extraordinary balance of knowing how much seaweed to harvest, um, branches to take off trees rather than felling them. And, and very particularly, there was this, this spot um, where three hills come together and the crust of the earth is actually quite um, thin, so you get this microclimate, the kind of microclimate Chip was talking about, where you can, in that um, Russian summer, grow melons and um, fruit trees and fantastic vegetables, and most particularly bees, not just for the pollination, but of course for the candles, because when you've got six months of dark, you absolutely need the, um, uh, the candles as well. And very incredible ways of um, connecting um, the islands with causeways so that um, it broke up the waves. You had pockets where fish would breed and you could still, um, you could work with the, um, the elements to get across there. Um, and it was also the first place where they tried hydroelectricity in, um, in Russia too. Gradually, my answer about where we go next is is that we have to think quite freshly. I mean, it, it, isn't, it isn't just a choice between um, intensive um, vegetable growing or industrialized maize growing. I think we have to start way back and ask some fundamental questions about what we eat, how we eat, how we grow it, how we relate to the land. I don't know what all the answers are, but. Technology, it isn't necessarily a backward-looking process. It can involve technology in going forward. And one of the things I'm particularly struck by is Basil Jert's solution for sewage in London. He's acclaimed as the great hero who, who saved London from foul sewage and, um, uh, and cholera. But actually, when you look at it now, and we're having to spend nine billion pounds on taking the sewage in a super sewer underneath the Thames further out into the channel so that it can disgorge into Holland instead, you begin to realize that actually he answered a lot of the questions that were put to him, but he didn't answer all of the questions that he should have done. And one of them was, actually, you can't rely on Argentinian guano for the rest of uh, civilization, night soil, actually is not waste. It is something that we really need to, to respond to. Nothing is waste. And had, had he taken a different approach, which was proposed at the time, to have lots of smaller sewage farms out from the, the city rather than channeling all of the sewage into the river, we would now probably be having a, a more interesting solution for, um, for the way forward questions incredibly effectively and sorted things out for over a century. But we probably need to ask deeper, more searching questions um, when, we, when we look at how we grow food and where we grow it. And, and the Arcadian principles are not bad ones to start with. The two things, it was interesting on your list, that um, 
Soil didn't appear on your first list of um, uh, environmental services, but it did on your second. And I would put water and soil as, as our two most important resources. Soil is living stuff, and it's not dirt, it, 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 which is interesting, one of the differences between America and, and, and Europe. I think soil is more venerated, and the life that it has, the fragile life that it has, and its role in carbon sequestration is, is incredibly important. That combined with water and how we use it and how, we, um, uh, and how much potable water we need, is, is, they're the two the big issues for, for me. And, and I'm sh sorry that, um, uh, I've already forgotten his name, um, Ma Mauro, yeah, has left because I put this in specially for him, uh, which um, is looking at how um, you convince people to chop trees down. These, are, these were the medieval water meadows outside Winchester, um, which um, come 1970, this was it in, in, in the 19... Um, 50s, and come 1970, when the dairy industry collapsed, um, they stopped grazing it, and very, very quickly, it became covered in trees. And actually, what that represents, so the, one area still remained um, grazed uh, in, in control of, um, uh, of the little um, uh, abbey here. Um, one, one remained grazed by trees, but the area owned by Winchester College um, just became completely covered over. Now, water meadows are one of the rarest and richest habitats that, that, that remain in the British Isles. They, it is a very adolescent landscape and relies entirely on man management. But the richness of that habitat is phenomenal in terms of wildflowers, insects, and salmon. And Gradually, we've been persuading a little bit further north of there, chop the trees down, and the wildflower meadow and the, um, the salmon spawning that happened as a result of that has been extraordinary. So climax vegetation with cuddly bears seems like the apogee of where we should be aiming for. But actually, in terms of biodiversity, ironically, those, uh, those landscapes that have been managed by man with nature for a couple of millennia turn out to have a richer biodiversity in terms of insects and floral diversity than the climax. And, and adolescence, um, for the young ones here, may be a richer time than um, senility. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and so it's, it's that understanding of, of how man, nature, food, and particularly flooding um, can work together. So these, these meadows in the huge rains of last winter saved Winchester from flooding. And this is another meadow just a little bit to the south of, of Winchester, which had been leveled for um, a helipad and a polo pitch. N neither of those is a natural bedfellow with a, a, a water meadow. And, and so fortunately, the property was brought by a rich banker, but with an Italian wife, um, who said, look, we've got to change this. And she said, can you bring the water back? And I said, yes, give me nine months and three diggers. We won't take anything away or bring anything in, but we'll move it all about and, um, and, and bring you back um, water meadows. Um, but, but not for intensive agriculture, in this case, particularly for the wildlife, and there is a, a wonderful um, little insect called the southern damselfly that had almost gone extinct, but needs open, alkaline, um, flowing water, very clear, pure water, which you get on these chalk meadows. And so um, the, 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 the damselfly was back before the diggers had left, um, as were the fish and the otters. But there's no reason why you have to do it in a medieval grid. You can move on, you can do something fresh. It was about making the water flow through. So it's something of our own time, but respecting all of the dynamics of, um, uh, of the place. So this is the moment where the hay has been cut uh, before the sheep come on. And you can see it, it doesn't look like something out of the Middle Ages, but it's understanding those principles. Um, there's the wonderful damsel. They're so rare that each one has a little number <laughs> written on their, their wing. And this is looking out uh, over the meadow, uh, which feels like a, a quilted landscape. 
And the magical moment, I haven't caught it yet on film, is in the evening when the, the mist rises, you get those weaving channels floating above the landscape in the air, and, uh, and then in the frost and, and the snow. So it's, it's a way of understanding that our relationship with land evolves, and we aren't hidebound by previous techniques and designs. We can absolutely move forward, but understanding that relationship between man, land, food, and water is, is the crucial thing. Um, and, and glorious, I had a yawn, okay. Right, we, uh, I, I will speed up and I won't necessarily uh, get to the end, but the, the other great thing about this um, is that um, it is above the flight path to Southampton Airport, so everyone gets to appreciate it. Um, I'm going to flick through this very quickly. Longwood Gardens, trying to instill their they only get a million visitors, not 1.3, um, but uh, uh, trying to instill in them the notion that water should be harvested, um, uh, venerated, and saved um, coincided with them asking me to design a new entrance to the, um, the, the whole glasshouse complex, which has a huge roofscape to collect water and, um, and then show people as they arrive what can be done with that water. Uh, at the moment, Previous to that, the glasshouse complex stopped here, and then there was a, a, a big, what they call the dough run, a big dip down here. So bringing a million visitors in um, and, and trying to create something uh, of, uh, of a moment where they can then look south to, towards the gardens. But also, having traveled all the way to Longwood Gardens, the first thing everyone wants to do is pee. And so the most important thing was to put in a big restroom block. They were working with the idea of something like a Versailles um, orangery. I pointed out as tactfully as I could that the one place you don't need a lot of glass is for lavatories, and that it might be better to tuck them under the ground and use the ground as the building. And, and so to work with the notion that the, the lavatory block is under this new um, earth form structure that creates uh, an amphitheater for performances there, and also south facing directs you down to the gardens um, with, um, with a spine of, of glass through the middle of it, so that what you end up with is the spine to the, um, uh, to the side here is the service area that they wanted to screen out, and here is the, the landform going down. I believe design is a, a, a whole process of kleptomania, and um, the, one of the great things about um, uh, previous examples is um, you can steal them and adapt them, and a dome with light filtered down from the top is a very good structural thing, and in terms of Insulation, it's great being under soil, and the Ottomans did it really well. So just stole the idea from the top Kapi Palace, from the um, harem there, and, and the light that comes down into, into these loos um, is great, but it also means that there's this 100-meter-long um, corridor in the center of the, the loo block where you can show how the water can be purified through plants and it's five meters high, so in one fell swoop, this suddenly was the biggest um, green wall in, in, in the whole of the United States. And, and it's become a visitor attraction in, in itself. And the greatest acclaim was when the trustees chose to hold their annual dinner <laughs> <laughs> in the lavatory floor. So on from that, I mean, with good food, and Susan has absolutely shown us what that's about. Um, but I promise to give you some solutions. And I think one of, the, one of the, my instincts is that we shouldn't just talk about food as though it were that. There's perishable food, which actually you need a lot of input. You don't need much soil to grow it, but you need a lot of water and a lot of input. Um, and it needs to be very close to where you eat it. And then there's grain. And actually growing grain in the Ukraine makes a huge amount of sense. But growing vegetables in Kenya and, um, and in the Ukraine and then shipping them um, to buy air so that um, you can eat them um, in Fortnum and Masons um, is, is not necessarily as logical as, as you should um, be. And my idea, I mean, not my idea, an idea that is really um, reaching some fruition is that you should grow salads and vegetables much more in the cities where, the, where they used to be grown. Um, and, 
And this, uh, there have been fantastic examples in, in Detroit and New Orleans and uh, Havana about needing to grow food close to, to where poverty is. But I wanted to show with this development, right by the Chelsea Hospital, Chelsea Barracks, 13 acres there, of prime real estate. It was, it was sold without planning permission for a billion and a half dollars. Um, and, uh, so, and yet we got the plan for it. Based, Chelsea has deep alluvial soils right by the river. Based that the whole residential mixed development should be entirely productive. So the main um, square leading up to the, the central square is entirely vegetable plots going up there. The main avenue is walnuts, an apple orchard, a nuttery, um, pears. And we have this system where um, a, a good percentage of every development has to be affordable housing, um, which is up here with their own allotments. And for the unaffordable housing, then you have professional gardeners who, who produce amazing food to be then uh, um, eaten in the restaurant in the main square or, or sold at, at farmers markets. And for a development of this huge expense to take on the idea that vegetables are beautiful um, and the whole principle that actually surrounds um, Villa La Pietra, that growing your food, seeing it being grown and eating it on the spot leads to a kind of understanding of, of nature and land and communicate a connection with it, which is invaluable in mental health and sanity. And talking of mental health, this is a typical um, English school playground of asphalt. And I studied at Berkeley, um, and I paid for my, um, my tuition by working as a busboy for Alice Waters, um, who gives me much better cred than the degree from Berkeley. And, and, and her work with the, um, uh, the edible schoolyard, teaching children not only to grow food but to cook it, I think has, has revolutionized um, uh, education. And if you can get them, like the Jesuits, if you can get them before the age of six, you've got them for life. So connecting children with land um, and, and plants early on makes a, a massive difference. So that's, that's another of my areas of, of, of hope. There's a danger that we get too worthy about this, too doom-ridden and wringing our hands and saying, we're, about, we're on the edge of destruction. We've got to give up everything. It's got to be painful. I actually don't think that's right. I think we've just got to think and see more clearly. And the whole point, as you said, is that this was about poetry and thought. There was the, thought, the, the feeling that if you didn't get your hands into the soil and watch things grow and labor physically, you couldn't set your mind free to, to, to fly. And, and I think that's what the Augustan poets were about. That's what the Renaissance was about. And that's where we need to go next. And so the moment where I saw Arthur flying free with his Prato Tondo and Prato Ovale, I realized it doesn't always have to be worthy and, um, and, and growing food. You can just do things because they're sculptural, because they're beautiful, because it makes your soul sore. And, and there is, in England, this lovely tradition of molding the land. This is Avebury Ring, one of the most sacred places. And, and then simple ridge and furrow, beautiful sculptural forms that work with the climate, with the soil, and with the agriculture. And then Andy Goldsworthy, who, who's just, he sees it, he, he sees the right through to the core of the cultural identity, the history. This is taking a wall for a walk, where um, he, he saw um, the, the tumble-down walls within um, the Lake District that had been replaced by a large plantation and then became a sculptural park. And he simply took that history, reinterpreted it, and made you see it in a very fresh and witty and poetic way. And it's a bad setup. When I was then asked to look at this place um, in um, Northamptonshire, Boughton House, um, the, the place had been laid out when the first Duke had come back from being ambassador at um, Versailles. And he, he really created this extraordinary landscape 
of, of kind of French um, mathematics. Um, and there, there is the, um, the house in the center of it. And very complicated mathematics flowing all the way out from it. It was a family that managed to marry fantastically successfully and, and became and remain the largest private landowners in, um, in Europe. So they, this mere 10,000 acre estate became very rapidly quite peripheral and it just went to sleep um, in the 1740s as they moved to their bigger estates in, in Scotland. And, and what remains, again, a very fine archive which shows this wonderful moment in the 1720s when the French influence was then taken over by the English idea of landscape. So the first Duke's son then doubled the size. I don't know if you can see, but here are his um, golden section uh, um, calculations. He doubled the size of the, the main um, broadwater. Um, what he dug up, he, he turned into a, a pyramid here, but opened out the view, stripped away the parterres and the flowers and a lot of the statues, and opened out the view into the productive landscape. So, absolutely seeing that the sheep and the cows um, and, and the growing of the food was an intrinsic part of the Arcadian idyll, but that the frame, the sculptural frame, was as important to it. Um, and, uh, and so that was what remained of his truncated pyramid. And you see the cedar here when, um, when I arrived. And that's that cedar and restoring it. And then opposite it, the current duke, very much in Roy's principles, said, but I, as well as restoring all of this, I want to do something of our own time. What are we going to do with that spot? This is a heavily listed, grade one, very rare landscape. But fortunately on the plans it said, the hurried over. Uh, and, and so that um, gave us a bit of leverage with English heritage. There's the pyramid, across it, the hurried over. And I think he had in mind a rival mound, kind of Scylla and Charybdis. But actually, it's such a special landscape that that would have felt rude, intrusive. So I suggested rather than going up, he should go down and invert the pyramid on the other side of the, of the water. And then, of course, you need to get down into it. So there's a spiral path that goes down to it. And it's all, everything here is based on the golden section. So that needed acknowledging at the surface and then it's over a half mile vista. So there's, the, there's a spring half a mile away where the, the projector is that I managed to bring to spring up in the middle of the golden section and then flow on the golden section um, spiral down um, into, the, uh, uh, into the pool below. And so that's, that's what it looks like with the pool uh, and, and the pyramid. And, and these actually were the candles um, that were put out for the opening ceremony never ever come to one of my openings. It always pours with rain. And then, the, the moment they'd started singing, boom. So those were the candles on the glorious morning the next morning. But, um, but it, was, it was about relating Olympus with, with Hades and just understanding that whole cultural continuity that we have and how gardens particularly Western gardens, have, have played with that through the, through the centuries. And also to work with the notion of James Terrell, this is his um, Nasher view of just when you frame something, you see it in an entirely different way. And there was getting to be a point where um, the family name is Dalkeith, and um, they, uh, I'd been talking about this as Hades at Bowton, and, um, and the Duchess rather wryly commented it, it was actually the Dalkeith Depression. Uh, and uh, so I thought, right, this needs rebranding very quickly. Uh, and as I walked down into the pit, yes, into Hades, I realized it's a quarter of a kilometer to walk down that path. It, it, this is very big. And as you walk down, it becomes quieter and quieter and quieter. And at the bottom, the acoustic is amazing. And, and the water bounces the sound off. And I thought, and as you get with this principle of Tyrell, as you get to the bottom, you look down into the sky, and then you can return from Hades to the surface. So on principles of music, acoustics, and Orpheus, 
not getting right to the end of the story of Orpheus, but, but the idea that it, was, that it was a good place for music, it became Orpheus at, at Barton, and, and actually we started with a performance of Orfeo. Um, and then began to wonder about how these mathematical principles would work, extrapolated into a new design, and just on a whim, uh, imposed Vitruvian Man on top. And, uh, uh, and then was also looking at Kensington Palace and thought, because this was Bridgman and Kensington Palace was Bridgman, superimposed him on that. And then suddenly, you know, these things do begin amazingly to, to make some sense. And there is that, that wonderful feeling that history collapses in on itself in a garden where you are absolutely in touch with the spirit and the poetry and the thoughts of man within nature in perpetuity. And so that's what it was like looking over, that's the half mile up to the, the square bowling green and um, lily pond at the top that um, the, the water comes down to. That was digging the hole. And the path, this is the water level, by the way, the path carries on, you can go down into Hades should you choose. And, and that's what it looks finished. And I always get asked, how do you mow it? Um, the, the, the answer is a, a very low gravity mower. We've now developed one that's completely um, remote controlled. So the gardener can sit in a deck chair and just mow from, from his seat. But this is to prove that even on slopes like that, in the pouring rain, you can do it. And then exploding out of the center of the, um, the, the golden section, the perfect cube of stainless steel, which actually catches the setting sun. And one of the ideas, this, a lot of people hate this, but um, uh, one of the ideas is that this is a place not just for music and opera, but also for all kinds of artistic interpretation. So you can put uh, a Holland cover over that and have a light show going on instead, or hang a chandelier from it, or, or whatever else. Each year, something different happens within that place. And there's the water going through. This, this is looking at it with a drone from the air. And, and to give you a sense of the size, that's, that's me down there um, photographing. Uh, it was the, the best, um, what do they call it, um, when you um, manage your soul manages to go up into the air, what do you call that? Um, uh, uh, anyway, um, it, it felt like I was able to uh, look down on myself through and take photographs of this. But you can get a couple of thousand people in, in there. But most importantly, when you look out across that landscape, you still see the 1720 landscape unimpaired, and it's only when you go down into Orpheus that you get the sense of the future. And I haven't got all the answers, but I think it doesn't reside in statistics. It resides in human spirit where we think things make sense, and actually growing food well, keeping the soil right, perishable food in cities, grain in the Ukraine, there is somewhere through there an answer. And it'll, it'll involve changing the way that we eat, changing the way that we think about food and, and agriculture. But deep down in Arcadia, there's something that I think will guide us forward. Thank you very much. When you're talking about Hades, where do the people actually, where does the audience actually sit in that? Uh, uh, Sorry. On, on the banks. And, oh, and, and, all the way as All, all the way, all down, the way and, down. And around the top as and well. And the musicians are. At we have a, a, a three level um, stage which can either be just under the water or at the water surface or just over it. So oh, it moves? Yes. Yeah. <gasps> and, and so I want, to, I want to, the thing I, apart from Orfeo, I want Rusalka. Um, to, to happen there with the, with the stage underwater. Okay. Nancy. And, and actually, Alice Waters is so brilliant. I mean, to have the gall to, to, to say to her clients, you grow all the vegetables in your own gardens, bring them to my restaurant, and I will charge you more than any other restaurant in the United States to eat your own vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and to continue as the most successful restaurant in the United States for that long. Uh, is you, you can, and, and I mean, Susan, what you're doing there, you're not replicating a cuisine, you're, you're actually taking it forward. And I think, I think you're right, Nancy, I think we can, the power of human imagination, if, if you get it right, is enormous. But I was absolutely right, we also have to convince government, but the amount of money that goes into subsidies and, and the, the amount of thought, of sort of the amount of interest that grows in, goes into growing maize in that amount of quantity uh, and then feeding it to animals in sheds, it, it works economically in some ways, but in terms of common sense, it, it doesn't make sense. And, uh, and, and I, think, I think we should still eat meat, but we should eat the right sort of meat in the right sort of quantities. And there is a way forward.